And if they had those canoes, we're going to use these canoes. Nobody else got to start. And here is Eisenhower. I don't have one plan. I've got three. I've got contingencies. I've made arrangements. The heck with those sabers. We're going to use, you know, war clubs so they can paddle as well. And clearly he is now Marshall's guy. All right. So he is going to be sent in to plan Operation Torch, our landing in North Africa. Going to be one of the most complicated, convoluted things of all time. And the plan is to land in North Africa in the French zone, Algeria um, and um, Morocco. And the idea is the big battle of Stalingrad is going on. And we want to stretch the German supply rubber band as far as we can. So let's attack in North Africa and give Hitler another theater to fight in. Now this was territory controlled by French troops who were now conquered by the Germans. And all French soldiers in uniform were now in effect part of the German army. Plus right by is Spain. Spain was neutral, but they are also fascist. And they had a garrison in Morocco. So the United States Army, the British Army, are going to land in North Africa, maybe fight French guys who are supposed to be our friends, and the Spanish guys who are supposed to be neutral. And we're going to have 670 ships leave from two or three different points, are going to rendezvous precisely out of third in November, and lead this attack. It is the first attempt at British and American cooperation with nationalist plot pride running heavy. Eisenhower is chosen to be the guy to lead this attack. And here is the problem with France. This part here, occupied France, is where there are German soldiers all over the place. The southern part is known as Vichy France. It was unoccupied but it was the collaborating government with Germany. So the president, Henry Pétain, works for Hitler, as do all French colonies. And if the French soldiers in the colonies didn't fight, their families would face reprisal back in France. So the idea is, are they going to fight us or not? And if we invade, are we invaders or are we liberators? Like who? Do we shoot here? And so Eisenhower is going to be sent to the British island of Gibraltar to plan this whole thing. He's flown there in a B-17 by the best Air Force pilot we have, a guy by the name of Paul Tibbets. For a while, the guy who flies the Enola Gay is Eisenhower's pilot for a while. And here in the danky, stinky tunnels of Gibraltar is where... Eisenhower is going to plan it's damp, it's, it's, it's not well lit, and he gets a room that in the day he's got his desk and a chair, his assistant Mark Clark has a desk and a chair, and at night they pull their desks out into the hallway and they lay in there in cots. And Mark Clark is so big at 6'5", they can't shut the door. This is the commander of the Allied troops going into North Africa, sleeping in a, a broom closet. Here's, you know, the good old Eisenhower and Mark Clark, who is kind of a doofus. I've got to tell you his story <laughs> real fast. And they're going to be hopefully working with one of these two guys. This guy here is known as Francois Darlin. He is the French territorial governor in North Africa. We want to see if he's going to help us. The other guy we're banking on is this guy here, Henri Garand. And Garand was captured um, by Rommel's men, um, or the German troops, coming out of the Arden Forest. And he was taken to a POW camp in Germany, and he escapes. And he's in hiding, and he's like a French folk hero. We want to secret one of these guys into North Africa to tell the French not to fight us. The big question is... How is Spain and how are the French going to um, react? And we're working through a diplomat by the guy by the name of Robert Murphy to try and see if anybody in this area is going to help us. But Murphy's a, a diplomat. 
He really doesn't know what to say. He can't give too much information away. And he needs help. And so the old Boy Scout mentality, I would rather have it, not need it, than need it, not have it. If we're not sure, then let's take a lot more guys than we think that we're going to need. So we're going to roll into North Africa really heavy. And arguments start right away. Why in the heck are we attacking North Africa? There's nothing there but sand. What are we going to do? Make glass? Who gives a hoot about North Africa? And church is like, bullet, hmm, you got to go to North Africa. Oh, bull crap. We're Americans, all right? Look, all right? If we want to attack Germany, then let's go into France. Hmm, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, Winston, that's what you said the last time. You guys roll around over here for three or four years. We had to come in, and we put the heavyweight belt on. All right, here we go. You know, you know we ain't got time to run around in North Africa. All right, let's go right at it. And Churchill's like, look, that may be true, but think about it this way. You need, these Germans are not easy. Trust us, we know. All right, Dunkirk sucks. All right. You don't know which one of your commanders can handle the job. Which one of your men can? You need a scrimmage. You need a warm-up. You need to bloody your troops. You need to figure out your command structure. And to go into northern France, we don't have the men or the equipment. If we lose there, we're never going to get ashore. And this will stretch Hitler's um, supply chain. So just listen to me. I've been at this for a while. Thank God we had the brains to listen to Churchill at this point. Because he turns out to be exactly correct. When this operation is given a 50-50 chance at success, Eisenhower says, well, shoot, I want the best guys we got. Royal Navy, I want Bertram Ramsey, the little Dunkirk guy, I want him. Helping with the Air Force, I want Jimmy Doolittle. He got back from his raid over there in Japan, I want Doolittle on this thing. Well, who are you going to need to command the ground troops? Well, you guys aren't going to like it. Why not? Well, because I don't really like this guy myself, and he's a friend of mine. So that should tell you. Well, who is it? Oh, God, you can't do it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Leading our troops is going to have to be George Patton. Patton? He's a psychopath. No one likes that guy. Well, yeah. But in the event of war, there's none better, all right? In time of war, break glass and unleash George. And you can, all right, really. Um, I wish we had more time to tell you stories. Patton, a little bit eccentric. Um, ancestry is from Virginia. Um, you know, a little bit after the Civil War, his family moves to California. Patton grows up a, a rich kid. But he's out riding horses and shooting guns and doing all this stuff, and his mom... You know, homeschools him, and she reads him the Iliad, and the Odyssey, and the Aeneid. He's like, yeah, Achilles, and, you know, Julius Caesar. And he wants to go to West Point, but he can't get in. Well, due to family connections, he goes to the Virginia Military Institute, studies up, and he eventually gets into um, West Point, um, where the guy said, you know, George, he was this full go. He's one of those guys that there was no... Like, there was no, like, you know, 50%. He was all in. So he plays a lot of sports, but he gets hurt a lot. He breaks arm, breaks his leg. But he's, like, the best horseman they have. Um, he's a really good swimmer. And he's a ferocious fencer. And the problem is, says, George, you have, you know, um, you know, thrust, but you have no parry. Like, you need to learn a defense. And he's like, well, why defend when you can attack? Well, sooner or later you got to defend yourself. He's like, no, I don't. If I'm attacking, then I'm going to, you know, score a point. Well, George, your, your game's incomplete. Well, I don't lose a lot, so... You know, <laughs> <laughs> right. This is how, how we're going to do it. So he winds up um, representing the country in the 1912 um, Olympics, where it looks like he is going to medal. Um, the last two events are his best. One is pistol shooting, and he can shoot with either hand, and he's got to fire 36 rounds. Well, through five and, you know, three-quarter rounds, Pat hits the bullseye every time. He has two shots left. There's no way he's going to lose this thing, and he fires two shots in rapid succession from a 38. Sixth shot, 
The range boss says, miss target. I was like, what the hell do you mean, miss the target? I didn't miss the target. I didn't even move my hand. I fired once and I fired again. Well, there's no bullet hole for the second bullet. He's like, that's because I Robin Hooded it. And they're like, what? He goes, I bet my sixth shot is on top of my fifth shot. They said, there's no way that's possible. So he gets marked down for a miss. He's mad. But he's still probably going to meddle. Later, they do go back and they pull the bullets out. And I'll be gosh darn if he didn't put the sixth one right on top of the fifth one. So they're going into the steeplechase. Patton's going to win this easy. But in these days, you didn't get to ride your own mount. You had to, like, draw straws. Patton is the last to go. If he just finishes before the time's up, he's going to win a gold medal. Well, somewhere on the course... Guys, he was one of the last to go. His horse slipped and rolled over like a hedge and a barricade. And when it rolled, it breaks Patton's um, clavicle. And everybody's waiting and waiting and waiting. And I can tell you from personal experience, breaking your clavicle hurts really bad. If you take a look at me, you'll notice my right shoulder is about an inch below my left shoulder. All right, there's no mistaking when you're like, oh, man, that's not good. Somehow Patton takes his belt off, makes a sling, gets on the horse, and finishes the course. I cannot tell you how painful that is. He the, finishes the course and passes out, but he doesn't know. He's sent to Texas. Oh, my God, it's 820. Um, he, goes, he, go, he goes to Texas where he meets up with John Pershing. He goes into Mexico to chase Pon Poncho Villa, and with a gun he bought himself for a graduation present, a 44 caliber, like Wild West, you know, um, Colt, like a John Wayne gun. Um, he kills three of Poncho Villa's henchmen, ties them to his car like deer, and drives them back. They go, George, you were supposed to capture him and interrogate him. Well, General, they were shooting at me. So what'd you do? Shot back. Did you have to kill him? And he's like, well... Didn't really think about it, but I figured if I killed him, then they couldn't shoot at me. So, anyway, all right, that's Patton. All right, and Patton, if you asked him, would freak people out. He said that he, his spirit was resurrected throughout time. When true evil existed on the earth, God would send him back to stop it. So, you would say, well, God, George, you know, what do you think it was like when Napoleon retreated from Russia? Well, I'll tell you what it was like. Well, George, you act like you were there. Well, I was. <laughs> yeah, okay. Man, what, what must it have been like in, in, in Zarma when the Romans killed the Carthaginians? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> All right. All right. And, and he really believed he, would, and he was there. So he's going to lead our forces in. So we're going to bring everybody that we can to make this happen. Oh, boy. Yeah. All right, okay, we're, we're going to go. All right. So, quarter of a million soldiers can, can be um, waiting for us there. And we're trying to sneak somebody in. And the goes, I am the leader of three fronts. Well, dude, you're the only officer that beat up his own men to get off. Can you help us? No, no, I cannot. Um, you know, we must liberate France. Not look, okay, okay, Charles, like, you know, whatever. So Mark Clark is sent in to do a nighttime, you know, sneak in undercover North Africa and see if Francois Darlin will, will help us. A submarine comes up off the surf. Mark Clark and some commandos go in. They hide their boat in this little barn. And Mark Clark is like the worst spy of all time. He's supposed to take a couple days and, and ask and probe around. And the first night, he goes into the French soldiers. Say, je suis American. Will you help us? And they're like, what? Yeah, je suis American. Liber American. They're coming. They're invading. So Clark runs in a running gun battle back to the beach. Some of his men get killed. Some get wounded. They're rowing their, their boat out to the submarine, and shots are being fired. And the family who, whose barn he hit his boat in, they get killed, and they didn't even know and he was there. So now the Germans know we are, are coming, and we need help. So Eisenhower calls on Henri Garand to come and help him. And he says... I'll come and see you in Gibraltar, but I'm not going to go on a British vessel. Well, why not? 
The British abandoned us. Dude, everybody got shoved into the ocean. They didn't abandon you. You guys, everyone, you can't blame that on the British. No, no, I do not like them. I will not go on a British vessel. We had to sneak him in by submarine. Closest American submarine was in Norfolk. So we take a British submarine. All the sailors go in the back. <laughs> we hang some American flag, bring an American captain, American XO, American navigator, and we put Garand on board and we're cruising to um, uh, Gibraltar. And someone forgot to tell the um, baker at 3.30, he comes in, all right, spin spot, cheerio, God save the king, time for tea. And the captain's like, well, who are you? Who am I? Well, I am, you know, Sir Bacon Crumpet. Who the hell are you, chap? <laughs> you know? And, well, what do you mean? I'm, you're not the captain. Well, yeah, this is the USS. No, it's not. It's the HMS. And we're like, what are you lying to me? You are all trying to fake me. I cannot trust you. And we're like, dude, our closest submarine was in Virginia, man. Come on. All right? So he gets to um, Gibraltar, and he's mad. And he's like, no, 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 this is wrong. And Eisenhower's like, look, can you go in and tell the French troops not to fight? If there's going to be invasion, I believe the army. What army? I believe the army to liberate France. Well, look, Haas, all right, your <laughs> army is in a POW camp. You were captured. This is a British and American army. You can, I believe in, if it's French, so I'm like, oh my God, no, 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 no. I don't even understand what you're saying, let alone my new soldiers. You can't lead the army. We need you to go in and, no, no, if you will not send me, then you cannot. I'm like, oh God, okay, fine, whatever. Get him the hell out of here. This is a funny story. Eisenhower sent his aide, go down to the armory and get me a sidearm. And they're like, what for, General Eisenhower? They can't get you in here. He goes, because if I see that SOB once again, I'm going to shoot him with my, I'm going to shoot him with myself. So we're not going to get any help. So Patton is um, sent in. On November 7th, the attack, somehow a group of boats coming from far away as Glasgow, Scotland, and Norfolk, Virginia link up off the North African coast, and the invasion goes in. And the invasion couldn't have gone more wrong if we tried. The British forces up here in Iran do fairly well. The attacks in Algiers and in Casablanca and down the coast in Fadala are a total screw-up. Our paratroopers land in the wrong area. We don't hit the tide right, so the tide is going out when we attack. So our soldiers are getting stuck in the mud. We were told the French Navy didn't have a presence there, and the French battleship, the Jean Bart, is in dry dock. It can't sail, but its big cannons can fire. So as our landing craft are getting off our ships, the Jean Bart opens up on them. So our covering fire has to go farther out to deeper water where it can get into a firefight with the Jean Bart. And the ship that does it is Patton's flagship, the destroyer, or the battleship, excuse me, the Massachusetts. And our guys get to the beaches, and they don't know what to do, and they're freaking out, and the French are fighting, and there's artillery going on everywhere. And up on the far end is this old medieval castle that had been improved upon literally since, you know, the heyday of, you know, Carthage, known as the Casbah. And French machine gunners are up in it, and Patton is watching this entire god-awful thing. And he's like, get, who's leading these troops? What is um, going on? And Patton screws up earlier. Oh, I'm running out of time. But... Patton wanted to get going, so when the Navy was loading the ship, he was going, what are you doing? Get that thing on board. Well, sir, well, we got to lay it all out here in the naval yard, and then we have a specific way we pack it. Son, don't talk to me. I'm the general. Get that crap on board this ship right now. And what you're supposed to do is take, like, the drums of gasoline and put them on the bottom, then, you know, the fresh water, then ammunition, then clothing, food, and medical supplies. Lighter stuff on top, heavier stuff on bottom. Well, with Patton yelling at everybody, we do it backwards. And in the heavy, rough seas, 
the water and gasoline slam down and they break all the medical supplies, the plasma and the blood encased in glass. Then they tip over and they saturate with water and gasoline, all the clothing, all the food. So everything in the ship is like a waste. So as we're trying to get off, we're like, oh, crap, I guess I should use the packing to the Navy. So Patton is pissed. Patton is um, embarrassed. And um, he's standing out on the deck, and this yellow paint just sprays all over him. And what you would do in the Navy is you would fire a, like a tracer round, a big shell of dye. And when it exploded, your rangefinder could see exactly how far away the target was. So Patton is covered from head to toe in this mustard yellow paint. And he's like, God bless it. And his aide is like, sir, do you want to change? No, get me a landing craft. I'm going down there. Well, sir, you can't go down there. By God, I can do whatever I want. Get me a landing craft. And Patton goes in, and he's one of those guys. Don't know how it happens there in every battle. He jumps out, and he's firing his six-shooter, and he pulls us, and he's not really shooting anything. Get out of the sand, son. Get going. Get moving. Well, General, they're shooting at us. Well, by God, son, if they were any good, they would have hit me. And he walks back and forth along the beach, screaming and yelling. You know, there's you know, explosions and the noise of combat. You know, the explosions, the screaming, the sheer terror. And when guys see Patton, they start moving forward. And little by little by little, they begin to um, engage. The fighting is fierce all the way up until November 10th. Patton was a, a, a Francophile, all right? He loved France. He had spent time there before and after World War I, um, knows a lot of guys, speaks the language fluently, and on November 10th, the free French forces stand down. They radio Germany, oh man, we fought with honor, we did the best we could, but these Americans and British soldiers came out of, of everywhere. Wasn't true. The French badly outnumbered us, but they could say we fought for our honor and there could be no reprisals back on their families back in, in, in France. We made it, all right? Barely. Everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong. But it stretched Hitler's supply line. And we look at this. Everything from how Patton loaded the ship to landing at low tide to not having good intelligence, to not having an operative on the ground, we begin to write it down and study it. So in the invasion of Sicily, Italy, and especially D-Day, we are not going to correct those mistakes. And it's going to be a long road, and there's going to be a lot of tension between the Americans and the British, but it's going to take time, but we're going to work out those problems, and both democracies are going to be needed to defeat Hitler. And Hitler now has to begin to start to wonder. I lost the Battle of Britain. I'm not doing well in Russia. These god-awful Americans are here. What happens next? So I'm going to fast forward because I know a lot of guys um, ha have to go. Erwin Rommel and the famous Africa Corps and his um, uh, you know, tiger tanks are going to blitzkrieg across most of North Africa. They're going to get stopped in western Egypt by a guy named Bernard Law Montgomery, who is the fourth British general in charge. And Montgomery is completely different than the aggressive go, 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 go Patton. Montgomery grew up in the trenches of World War I. So he's very hesitant of just outright offensive action. Everything is going to be planned. And at El Alamein, he uses... Rommel's tactics against it, and he defeats him. He stops Rommel and begins to roll him back. Here's little Bernard Law Montgomery, and here's Rommel. Begins to slowly push him back across North Africa. Now, Rommel's troops were tired. They were, their vehicles were breaking down from fighting. It looks like, if you've seen um, Empire Strikes Back, it looks like the Battle of like Hoth out here. Right? They're really all right, fighting in, in, in the desert, in the sand, in the grit, is wearing on the men. Rommel is badly sick. And you know what? 
It happens to everybody. And go, well, you know, well, well, if our army had been broken down, well, you know what? It was, all right? And that's not, um, you know, the um, Allies' problem. Rommel and the Africa Corps had done great things, but now, some shortage of supplies, men, and gasoline, they get beaten again and again and again. And i got to tell you this one last um, story. As Montgomery is pushing him from one direction, we've now landed and we're going to sandwich and trap some of the best German soldiers there are. They're in North Africa to bail out Hitler's buddy Benito Mussolini, but we're using old World War I tanks. This thing is known as a, as a Stuart tank, and it shoots a 37 millimeter cannon. When we first go into combat, it shoots a solid metal projectile round, and as it hit the German tanks, our gunners were like, oh my God, Like we missed. Maybe it's the heat of the desert. What's going on? And they fired the second and third time, that's when they realized they were making direct hits, but the German tanks were so much stronger, it just bounced off. No. All right, and the guys in the Stewarts get massacred. And here is my last story. The nice guy, his name is Lloyd Friedenhall. Friedenhall is literally Dwight Eisenhower's best friend in the world. And he gets defeated at a place known as the Kazarine Pass. Don't know really what went on in there. Um, Rommel retreating, realizes he's got the British here, the Americans here. He says to be able to escape North Africa, he's going to hammer the Americans, fall back in some defenses until he can make a case to get his guys out of the um, continent. And the Kazarine Pass, parts of it, I've interviewed three guys that were there, and they all tell the same story. We were put down in the valley. The Germans came from the top, they came around from the back, and it was just, they were everywhere. We were boxed in, the fighting went on into the night, and it was every man for himself. We fought, we punched, we kicked, we stabbed, and we kept heading west until we got out of there. said, I don't know if I fought friend or foe, you couldn't tell at night, it was this sheer chaos. Parts of it are still under presidential sealed orders not to be opened until 2042. So when that happens, you know it's really, it's really bad. All right, we, you know, we're going to, everyone involved is going to be gone before we find out what happens. Well, Eisenhower comes out. That's when he's like, I'm not a battlefield commander. And he goes to the front, and he sees these Stuart tanks blown to hell and thousands of dead American soldiers. He's like, where's General Friedenhall? Well, who? General Friedenhall. Well, I don't know. I don't even know what he looks like. Well, where's our anti-tank guns and where's our anti-tank mines and our barbed wire and our bazookas? Where are they? I don't know. And he rolls around and um, finally, 60 miles from the front lines, Eisenhower finds Friedenhall and he goes up this twisting, windy road and it's got barbed wire everywhere, and concrete blocks, and anti-tank mines, and up this serpentine switchback trail, and engineers are tunneling into a mountain, and he's like, excuse me, like, oh my God, General, what are you doing here? Well, I'm looking for General Friedenthal. Well, he's just about ready to have lunch. Well, guys, why isn't all this stuff at the front where our men need it? Well, I don't know. General Friedenthal told me to build it here. And Friedenthal comes out and says, Ike, hey, or we got a rack of lamb on you want to come in and have lunch. And Eisenhower's like, Lloyd, with me right now. Well, man, Ike, calm down. 8,000 Americans might be dead, wounded, or missing. What do you mean? Come on, you know, don't worry about it. We'll get them next time. Worry about it. Look at this place, Lloyd. It's a fortress. All this is for the American men. The president wants my head. I need to explain it. What are you doing here? Well, I'm just making my headquarters safe. Lloyd, you're 60 miles from the front, moron. So I'm sorry to do this to you, but you're fired. You can't fire me. I, we're friends. Well, I can, and I am. All right, now I'm not going to fire you from the Army, but I'm going to send you back. I'll let you collect your pension, and you are going to train men for combat because you can now say you've got combat experience. But this is unacceptable. Well, who's going to replace me? Well, I've had a guy causing a bunch of trouble in Casablanca <laughs> running his mouth, and his name is Pat. 
And so Patton is brought in. He is going to reinvigorate the Seventh Army. Um, here is the last remnants going down into um, um, Kazarine Pass. Here's our man George. Um, Patton will um, defeat the 10th Panzer Corps at El Guitar after Rommel was removed to go back to convalesce in, in Germany. The only problem is, and what Patton's big um, uh, uh, beef with Montgomery is, he says, we need to trap these guys here. All right? We're coming from this direction. Montgomery, quit inchworming your way along and let's cut them off. Because if we don't, we're going to have to fight them again. Unfortunately, um, the Africa Corps makes it to Sicily, where part of them escape again, and they make it to Italy. By that time, our man George, who does great things, gets himself benched for slapping the helmet off of a soldier with shell shock. So for about a year, he is out of the game, and um, the invasion of Italy goes off without him. So... That was really short, really quick. I cannot believe. I hope it makes sense. Oh my God, we did so much. Um, Battle of North Africa. It's not really flashy. It's not really dramatic. But it really begins to pay off as, like Churchill says, we sift out our commanders who can do the job. Patton, Omar Bradley, Bernard Law, Montgomery. These are the guys, most of them, that are going to be taken right after Sicily up to London to begin to plan for the dramatic D-Day invasion. Patton is, is in a lot of trouble, but he is useful. That football plays that he sent Eisenhower, when everyone wants his head, Eisenhower says, no, I got George. He's an idiot, but we're going to need him. I know how to handle Patton. So he makes Patton apologize publicly, and for the next year, he is a tour guide. All right, when a visiting dignitary, a VIP, wanted to know about a Roman battle, Carthaginian battle, an Egyptian battle, Patton had to give him a tour. And what Eisenhower realizes, very funnily, is that wherever George was, a bunch of German troops were diverted. So they start, well, what if we put him in Cairo? Bang, German soldiers. What if we put him... You know, in Crete, bam, German soldiers in Athens. <laughs> They're like, oh my God, we can use Patton as the world's greatest decoy. <laughs> so anyway, um, anybody has any questions, it is 20 till. Um, this is it for the year, so thank you guys for um, uh, uh, coming out. Uh, I was going to do the invasion of Sicily, but we did a little bit of the... the, of the um, Battle of France first. So, guys, thank you for coming out to for, um, see the high school. Hope to see you at D Day. It's all about D Day. It won't be four or five um, and different things. It's how I got my start, the whole story. Um, my grandfather flew B 24s, and I remember watching The Longest Day, July 4th, 1976. And I'm like, wow, Grandpa, you know, you were brave flying a plane. He's like, oh, that was nothing compared to these guys. And I remember my mom didn't want me to watch it because it was too, you see how benign the longest day is? Like, you know, <laughs> um, bum, 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 bum. And so that point is where I got my World War II hook, and D-Day has been my thing um, ever since. So um, have a great evening, everybody. Um, Enjoy a nice, um, warm night. I'm going to the Carolina Brewery to get dinner and a Coke, if anybody wants to join me there. <laughs> and uh, a Coke. A Coke you know. None of that diet stuff, but like a real, um, a real Coke. So if you have any questions, I'll stick around. If not, have a good night. And uh, if I don't see you in May, we'll see you next year. So anyway. All right. Have a good night, everybody.